It's my uh, privilege to introduce our speaker this evening. Richard Fragaviglia is a historian and geographer who's interested in the way landscapes change the time and how that change is depicted in maps, art, literature, and film. For more than 40 years, he studied the geography of Mormonism and the history of map making. He's the author of many books, at least 11 if I count, on American history, geography, and culture, including The East Young Man, Imagining the American West as the Orient, published in 2011 by Utah State University Press, and a brand new book just out this year in the University of Utah Press, The Map Maker of New Zion, A Cartographic History of Mormonism. Native California, Professor Frank Biglia received his PhD in geography from the University of Oregon. He taught history and geography at the University of Texas at Arlington and directed the Center for Southwestern Studies and Historical Cartography at UTA until he retired in 2008. He currently lives in Salem, Oregon and teaches courses on Mormonism, Islam, and Islam in America at Willamette University. Please join me in welcoming Professor Frank Beagle. Thank you very much for that warm introduction and uh, appreciate everybody moving over to the new venue where we can start. I see I have a uh, clock there keeping me honest. How many minutes that clock? Five zero. Okay, that's, that's perfect. There's some QA after that. Okay, perfect. Yes. Uh, Brian mentioned that I currently teach at uh, Willamette University in Salem as an adjunct in my semi-retired state and doing a lot of traveling and other things and and uh, one of my students last night uh, in class and I, I mentioned what I'm going to be I won't be able to be at the lecture tonight on ISIS and the destruction of cultural properties uh, in the Middle East and so I thought well I'm going to be talking about something more constructive tonight and that is mapping uh, the uh, American West and the world right? and so um, LDS culture has interested me. I'm not LDS, but LDS culture has interested me for about 15 years. And I felt from the very beginning, as I encountered the landscape of the Mormons in the West on trips from Oregon back to see uh, my wife's relatives in the Washington, D.C. area, and other things. And whenever we encountered the, uh, the Mormon West, the, the landscape appeared to be very distinctive to me. And I came to know uh, through my PhD work many uh, wonderful Mormon people who I realized that there was something distinctive about the Mormons too, as well as their landscape. Another, another thing that influenced me very much while we were talking about my bio sketch there, and that is that my very first job out of high school, I wasn't planning on going to college and I got a job immediately out of high school in San Francisco at Rand McNally and Company Maps. And for a kid who always loved maps, for some reason, I always found maps fascinating. This was a tremendous opportunity to uh, learn more about cartography, the art and science of map making. Most of you know the name Rand McNally. Of course, it used to be the gold standard in maps for, uh, you know, if you traveled on a train, your map was by Rand McNally. So. There for a couple of, uh, as I worked there for a couple of years, they realized I was the kind of kid who always spent his lunch hour looking at books or reading or spending his weekends going over and crossing the mountain and studying something. They said, You really got to go to college. And I was terrified. And I said, Really? And they said, Yeah. So they even put up some money to help me go. I mean, I think they tried to rid me, but no. They put up money, they gave me a pen and pencil set, you know, and they set me on. And they were right. I discovered um, 
at uh, Foothill College in the Bay Area where I started, uh, junior college, community college, uh, I, dis I discovered that, yeah, that in, in, in the intellectual world, you can even study delightful quotes such as that from Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. The narrator Marlowe says, when I was a boy, uh, I used to look at maps of the world and the ones that attracted me most were the ones with the big empty spaces on them. And as I looked, I said, felt the sense of adventure. I want to go there someday. And that really struck a chord. And it's the kind of thing that it motivated me when I was a kid to think about travel and the world around me. So with that in mind, I want to share with you some insights on my um, uh, book called The Mapmakers of New Zion, A Cardiographic History of Mormonism. In this book, I had a chance to sort of retrospectively visit a topic that interested me for a long time, and that is when I studied the Mormons, when I would go into the church archives in Salt Lake City, you know, Whitney Brickens, Journals, diaries of settlers, and all how they shape the land and everything. But there were maps in the archives too. Sometimes it was almost coincidental that those maps seemed to find their way in there because they weren't cataloged the same way. And they only see, frankly, some of them like a second thought. Like, what do we, uh, we, we leave our book here because it came from you no know, correspondence at the time or something like that in this past. Sometimes the maps had lost their provenance in, in, in the archives. They didn't know where they were from, but they were interesting, so they had to So about 10 years ago, I started revisiting this topic and studying the, in the archives, which is like Mecca to, to me. If I may use a Muslim <laughs> and, and, and And I realized that these maps are part of what would be, the, would, would be declared in the... Uh, in the DNC, in the Doctrine and Covenants, as you know, behold, there shall be a record kept among the Arabic. But the more I thought about it, well, why not? Why can't it be visual? Joseph Smith was a very visual thinker. Joseph Smith was a very geographic thinker. I have a, 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 an article for an entry in the New Oxford Handbook of Mormonism. I think that's what it's called. I apologize for not going to talk to you, but it's got really some very interesting essays in it. And I was asked to write on Mormons and geography. And I tailored the article to Mormons in a sense of geographic identity. And the more I think about it, you can talk about Muslims and their awareness of where Mecca is at all times, and we pray five times a day there, but I <coughs> believe that the Mormons have built in almost in their DNA now a, 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 a geographical set of, of uh, uh, traits that enable them to know north it's largely created in an orthogonal grid north south east west and this goes way back so uh this is a little different than the normal frankenbeal well it isn't a normal frankenbeal you can immediately determine by now but the normal frankenbeal uh, presentation will have lots of text this is going to have just about a dozen images so the first image that I want to show you, and am I in control of this or? Uh, yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So it's the uh, the top button, or it's, it's the one. How many people know instantaneously what this is? Forty-three percent of the audience. <laughs> now that means that this document, by the way, and remember, I'm not LDS. This document is one of the most important documents in American history, and it is a document that was authored, if you will, by Joseph Smith Jr., the man, right, and Frederick G. G. Williams. Now, this is the City of Zion plan. So the city of Zion Park. This was prepared in 1833. Nominally, people say this is Joseph Smith's map, but actually, it's Joseph Smith's idea as written down in that form by Frederick G. Williams. 
So this is uh, one of the first takeaways from this lecture, is that cartography, or the art and science of math making, is usually a collaborative effort, right? It's more than one person, even though we think of a person drafting the map, he or she gets ideas It used to be more he's than she's, and now that's changing, but at any rate, this map is a collaborative effort. It's not technically a revelation, but yet it's believed to be inspired because it tells the saints in the 1830s how to lay out uh, the, the Far West community uh, in, uh, in uh, Missouri as the Mormons were gazing westward, further and further, or farther and farther, we should say, in the United States. And this is supposed to be the prototype for the way the city will be laid out. You'll notice that this map has writing along the margins. It's meant to be read. You'll notice that, and by the way, one thing to be aware about this map, the first time I had ever seen it uh, as a copy uh, in a book, uh, John Rex, The Making of Urban America, was in black and white. I had no idea until I saw it uh, about 10 years ago that it's in color and that it uses a beautiful wash of sort of a light green and salmon color to delineate this city. This is not just any city. This is the city for the second coming. This is the city that's mentioned in Revelation. This is the city that's four square with the compass and that is basically a place that's sanctified, if you will. So that's another thing that makes it an extremely important document in history planning. And planning is that it's basically a document for how to lay out a community, but not just a regular community, one based on spirituality. So this is the first map. How many religions do you know that can claim that at the, at the very roots is there's a map involved? So the Mormons come along at a time in history, world history, but US history too where cartographic literacy is on the increase. There no longer were maps held by people like, you know, Roman generals or somebody else or certain land holding, but everybody begins to have access to maps. Maps then are in the hands of people who are shaping history themselves. And in the case of the Mormons, they're going to be doing a lot of shaping of history uh, in the uh, Americans, so to speak, uh, using in part this map as a prototype. Now, people will tell you that in, in Utah today, the, uh, the cities are laid out just like this in the city of Zion. Well, not true. What happened is that basically they served as an inspiration. But as the saints got out farther west, they realized that certain things were going to have to happen to this plan to make it more amenable to the kind of environment and other conditions that face the saints after 1847. So that we have then the iteration of this idea of a city of Zion, very carefully laid out by religious authorities, but it is no longer the exact copy of this, but it's uh, somewhat different, but it becomes a very distinctive template for Mormon communities. That's what blew me away when I was driving, putting 30,000 miles on a Volkswagen in the 1960s, driving around and all these communities in the West. Their adherence to this grid the width of the streets, 132 feet wide, was very typically still reproduced in Utah. And it's based on the, the, this map, which says that the streets ought to be 132 feet wide. Uh, the buildings ought to be brick, brick and stone, uh, and, and that's what Mormon architecture tended to be a higher concentration of brick and stone buildings in their towns, as you can see even today. So that's, that's just one map, but I'm gonna to try to uh, Maybe just give about five minutes to each of these maps. If I do my map correctly, I should be okay. I said, no, I didn't press the right button. So if I press that again, it was miraculously. Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, let me talk about this. Let me try it again. Do I point it anywhere in particular? Right there? Oh, that'll do it. Thank you. Yes, okay. Now, this map is phenomenal. It's by W.W. W. Phelps. 
1849. And uh, when my students encounter this map, they are nonplus almost because they don't quite understand what it is at first. One of them says, is it, you know, uh, several of them ask, is it like an anatomical drawing? Is it show a dissection of something? Is it something like a pancreas operation? <laughs> what it is, is, and I got a pointer here, right? Let's see. Yeah. Well, that's what the, I'm the most happy people who are here to the audience. <laughs> okay. I am licensed to do laser surgery, too. That's my work. Okay, here. There you go. See, was it there? Okay, yes, there we go. I love it. It's green. Okay. All right. And this is in color, too. I've seen this map once before reproduced in black and white, and it didn't resonate quite the same way. But here, Phillips, who is a very interesting character, you know, he was a, a scribe, so he's a real close person to Joseph Smith, uh, had a very illustrious and very exotic and erratic kind of career as a Mormon, frankly, but uh, he was really passionate about his faith. And he was passionate about the new Zion. So what we have here is, this diagram of Utah, Juab, Juab, and San Peter, San Pitch Valley. And basically what we're looking at here is the Utah Valley here and the lake. And then we go down over here uh, and uh, east is up. This map is oriented uh, uh, east. And it says the Great Basin Rim here. So this is Mount Nebo and the, and the, the, uh, the Wasatch Mountains. And we're looking down almost in a cascading way at the various topographic features, including these broad these valleys, and uh, the uh, San Pete Valley here, and so on. And so this map, by the way, was, he calls it a diagram because he knows he's not a professional map maker. By this time, map making has gone in several different directions. There's a vernacular kind of more common folk like this man, and then there's highly professionalized, sometimes military, sometimes scientific map makers, and Mormons did find a role in those occupations too. But at any rate, here we have then a, 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 a map of the area, and of uh, this group of people traveling southward to reconnoiter all of the uh, areas claimed by the, uh, the Latter-day Saints, uh, from, from, in this case, going southward. Uh, they show this to uh, uh, Wakara, or Walker, Chief Walker, uh, the Indian chief was considered sort of the Napoleon of the West, and he says, um, he says he could recognize this. He could recognize this, and he started talking about the different features and so on, and as one of the Mormons in the group said, uh, he, he showed his skills as a geographer, the, the, the Native American did too. Uh, input on maps like this was, was likely from Native Americans also, so that Mormons had an interaction. Action with it, but this is a really important map. And in another, pre in another presentation, I compare this to Google Earth maps and show how you can position that map sideways again because we tend to think north is up, even though orienting the map, we always refer originally to the orient, orient being east was up, likely pointed toward Jerusalem. Um, and so uh, we don't know why he oriented the map this way, but other people, other Mormons at the time, were also drawing these maps with east up, but we don't know if that's uh, why they did it. It may be that the topography of the area was so prominent that they felt that the way this, as I use the term before, cascaded downward, that it was something that, you know, conveyed the certain impression of the land. So if I would summarize the first map that I showed you, the city of Zion Park, as one of collaboration and inspiration, uh, this map is one of, let us call it, um, uh, uh, appropriation of the place by the Mormons, but also a visualization of the place, trying to convey some sense about the lay of the land. This just wasn't any land, or this wasn't just any land, this was the land that Providence had given to the Mormons, or them to settle. And Phelps and others knew the stakes were high and uh, acted accordingly in trying to get this kind of geographic information back to headquarters, so to speak back to the church headquarters in Salt Lake City to convey information about this. Because at the same time, Brigham Young is ordering stuff like this to be done, and other people are working as multitasking Mormons doing this, the feds are also mapping very aggressively. The Mormons are helping with some of the federal work, but they're all at times. 
This is a tremendous map. It's one of a set of three or so that relates to the settlement of Las Vegas, Nevada, at that time called the Vega. Uh, and um, you notice that east is up again on this, at least that's the way the text is. This was done in 1855 as the Latter day Saints were moving down into the Moapa area, into the southern area of uh, Utah, and into, then into Nevada, or is today Nevada. They, uh, they were calling upon other saints who had experienced other parts of the region from their map, and then John Steele comes in and he maps the area this way. And what this shows us is that it is not only an appreciation for the sort of wild landscape that surrounds this sort of semi-bowl-shaped valley in which Las Vegas is located, and you can even see that he's sketching out vegetation patterns, but he's also showing how the area is laid out into property parcels. So this is, again, appropriation going into colonization. So the latter and saints are drafting maps for many different reasons for us to uh, ultimately claim such a large area. Las Vegas means Americas. Note the topography here. If you know Las Vegas, you can recognize some of the features today. Uh, on another PowerPoint, my grandsons were helping me with this. And when they first looked at this map, they said, wow, that is far out. And, and you're not looking at this as an exactly, well, it's a little crisper in its original. But what they felt was that this map was really kind of almost interactive. A lot and, and watching them play video games, I don't understand why. The video games in which people are you know chasing each other through the brush and around through the hills and stuff like that. And so they really identified with this. This uh, uh, Steele, John Steele was a intuitive genius when it came to mapping. And he sent this to George A. Smith, the fossil Smith of uh, Salt Lake City, saying, I'm inviting this to you in the correspondence so that you can see. that word C is the operative word here because it means that they could uh, visualize not only the place but the saints role in it. Alas, they had to pull back uh, toward the end of the 1850s, but uh, still, of course, Mormons have no presence today in Las Vegas, but this, these maps and, and, and uh, another cartographer that helped lay out some of the parameters of this kind of map are the first known maps of Las Vegas and that. Another very important uh, map that uh, is associated with uh, uh, the saints in the 1850s uh, is uh, a map that takes us from the, uh, the area of southern Utah and up into an area that is out of the cosmic boondocks, which is basically the area along the Nevada, Cal Nevada Utah border. And this is when the Mormons were preparing to flee from the persecution of the federal government in the 1850s. It was an expedition that was mounted to move out into this area to reconnoiter it. And the operative word here in this map is refuge. It's a way of trying to get away from Babylon, which was uh, closing in on, uh, on Utah. Of course, the Mountain Meadows Massacre had occurred just shortly before this, but there was real fear that the Mormons were going to be exterminated or just uh, uh, attacked, and so the saints prepared to leave there. I recommend the book Search for Sanctuary by Clifford Scott. It's probably a 30-year-old book, but it's... Uh, has anybody read that book, Search for Sanctuary? If you're interested, you're LDS and you're interested, only one person in the audience, two, three, four, five, okay, well, that's good, but that's only three and a half percent. So... <laughs> If you want to read a really interesting book about the trials and tribulations of being the saints, the Latter-day Saints in the, in the 1850s, read Search for Sanctuary. It's a low by low account of how the Mormons moved out into the area of uh, uh, near Great Basin National Park. Way out to, uh, Lee Green. 
and and then uh, and, and the reason they do they put that far is Salt Lake City is too lush. Salt Lake City now has been built. We want to go to a place that's so godforsaken that nobody else will follow us and persecute us. And so that's what they're going to And the Vatican's appreciate that because they want to do that. But basically, uh, that's what they uh, do. And Anaka and other places out there, some of you may know some of these Okay, now here's an interesting map, and it's a blueprint. And it's a. Um, the other map, I talked about refuge and seeking. Well, this is also involved with seeking refuge. And this is a map when the, um, in, in particular, polygamists were fleeing the United States. But polygamy always in the real subtext here in this kind of, of uh, persecution. And so, so that uh, what you can see here is the uh, U.S. Mexico border. It is New Mexico. And you can see here the um, uh, various Mormon communities that are laid out along these lines in the northern part of Chihuahua. And so the Mormons uh, replicated their Mormon villages south of the border uh, um, uh, freedom, if you will, from persecution. And so uh, the map maker, the map I just showed you, James H. Martin, very interesting map maker, and again, a classic Mormon multitasker who could uh, you know, do all kinds of jobs as well as survey and map. But uh, he, uh, they went to this area too. And so people like Martin all are involved with laying out communities in Arizona too, uh, in the area of uh, St. David, you know, St. David and, uh, and other places. Okay, so again, the operative word here is um, new start. Uh, or hopefully a new star. Of course, as we know, it was still fated basically because the saints were uh, basically on the wrong side of the Mexican Revolution. And that turned out to be, uh, the saints thought they could actually be on the right side of that revolution, but they were associated with uh, the Porfirio Diaz government and all kinds of things. And so they were basically driven out of uh, Mexico. That's hence uh, Mitt Romney saying that his family too was refugees or whatever they said, something like immigrants, you know, too. It was kind of odd with an Anglo coming in from Mexico, but that's the way it, that's the way it was portrayed. He's right, because they had to flee backwards up into uh, the area that was they had fled from because of the deprivations of the uh, of Mexican rebels. And that ultimately displaced about a million people. Uh, most of the Mexicans, of course, who came into the United States. And incidentally, uh, uh, if you look at maps, maps are always trial and error, and people try to get it as right as they can. But basically, it, this map shows railroad lines don't even exist, and uh, and it almost looks like they're the fact of life, but uh, they are not. And so this map is one of those that looks like it was put together from a series of other maps. That's another thing to recognize about maps is that they they invariably involve the previous work of former map makers. People don't really just start making a map and just do it from whole cloth. It's big or that's it. They, they take it and they take other maps and they plagiarize it if you want to, or whatever they can do. Uh, this map's kind of dear to me. Now, you know where we are in South America. This is uh, another whole set of more than maps that I talk about in my book. And that is, and this is a really interesting subject to me is mapping the Book of Mormon. Now, as you know, this is a controversial subject for saints because typically the church has said that you really shouldn't do that. I mean, because the, these are words in the Book of Mormon, and, and when you then make pictures of the words, and that's what a map is, it's a, it's a, it's a delightful combination of narrative and image. And when you, when you put something on a map, you are fixing it in place that could be false. Whereas if you say they went northward, who's going to argue? <laughs> when you do this, you got to show where they went. I know, I grabbed the maps that had one error in them, and I've been torn to shreds by academics for misplacing a dot, you know, like five miles wide. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She vanished. You know, <laughs> so, you know, you can show me a map that doesn't have an error on it, and I'll, you know, I don't know what I'll do, but. 
Okay, so, but, but let's get back to this map because it's really exciting to me because, by the way, no matter what I come in the world, I keep on running into Mormons. Are you, are you guys after me or what's happening? <laughs> I, go to, I go to the Middle East, right, and I run into Mormons. I go to Europe, I go to, I go to the Pacific, I go to the South Pacific, right? and then I go down to South America. And, of course, I know that uh, Mormons have had an extremely successful missionizing uh, efforts in uh, Latin America. But Chile interests me, and I was intimating this to some of the folks, but the time is going too fast here. I was, because I've always been interested in the Atacama Desert of Chile. And what one realizes about this map is that Lehi really lands here. Oh, oh, no, I didn't want to, be, I want to land in there yet. Can I go back across like this map? <laughs> oh, good. Okay, this be okay I'm on this. Okay, now, here, let's see what I want right now. Lehi, Lehi, okay, the landing here, okay. And what, what happens here is that this is uh, um, from Joel Rick's work, 1917. And he has two maps, one the land southward, one the land northward. And these are part of a rich discourse in Mormonism regarding how you place events in the Book of Mormon geographically. Anyway, so people have, people have dedicated their lives to this, right? Uh, sometimes people say that it's driven them mad practically, you know, because they try to find places where things happen and where, where they describe. But as I, I know Chile pretty well, and I've actually, and again, don't ask me why I did this, but actually traced this route on this map, I mean, no, in the real world, up, up into the Atacama Desert of Chile. And, and lo and behold, this is interesting to me, and I want to find out a lot more about it, because at first you say, you know, and as I say in the book, this, this seems to be really kind of very, very interesting choice of landing places, 30 degrees south, and then they then go northward and then find themselves over here in their Nephi's temple and so on. And what you see here is this is this describes basically all of this area, the Atacama Desert, which is uh, generally regarded to be the driest desert in the world. So, you know, you say, well, wait a minute, well, you're here, and it's described as lush, and the Coquimbo Valley is rather lush in, uh, in this area. But, it, but people are talking about this in the 1830s and 40s about these places, being, these, these geographic things being like this. And so uh, this describes one of the early roads uh, uh, used by uh, the Spanish, Spanish user later. But this describes one of the early parts of the Inca Trail that came down off the front of the Andes Mountains, which are shown very generally here, off the Andes Mountains down into places like San Pedro de Atacama and Copiapó. Anyway, uh, my next book is going to be on how the Atacama Desert became part of the popular imagination in the world, and it has really resonates. How many people have heard of the, the Atacama Desert? Okay, Atacama Desert. How many people have been to the Atacama Desert? You see? But in case you didn't get that, it was 26%. And then zero. <laughs> so it means that we've all heard about it, and you really ought to go. But anyway, the second best thing is to buy my next book coming out, 3900, <laughs> possibly even listen to Utah Press. I didn't want to commit you to that job. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a wonderful study, but we got to move off because we still have a few more maps to go before. Now, this is a map from a brochure. I innocently went to do some consulting in Honolulu, Hawaii in the 1970s. Predated Magnum PI by a few years. And I went there and I was, that's an end thing for anybody over 50 years. <laughs> They're running Magnum PI as reruns on TV, and I just picture to the old time and said, I remember when we were young watching that. <laughs> no, nobody under 30 knows what that is. Okay, but seriously, in Hawaii, I ran in the mornings again, but naturally. And so I went to the Polynesian Cultural Center, right? And so I picked up the brochure, which I dearly love the, the sort of graphics of this. It's very, uh, very like 1960s of the Disneyland kind of thing. And in fact, there is something to be said for the fact that not only is this an interesting map, it's on a brochure, and it shows the layout of the Polynesian Cultural Center, which is done very respectfully to try to preserve the cultural traditions of Polynesian people. 
But when you look carefully at the Polynesian sector's layout itself, it suggests that the various lands in it, like the various lands of Disneyland, and this, this date from the 1960s, this, this theme park, if you will, educational theme park, that this can be considered to be almost a map of the Pacific and the various islands and realms around it. Now, speaking about taking risks and thinking outside of the box on what maps can do, them, like you can even configure a place like Walt Disney configured uh, Frontierland or Disneyland to be a metaphorical or allegorical map of the American West. Wow, hey, wait a minute. Maps can be more than just on paper. Can be used for purposes like this to convey aspects of the challenges and controversies facing the Mormon church and Mormons themselves. And so Sunstone Magazine uh, contracts an artist to draw a, uh, a uh, create a map showing the various kinds of tensions and everything that go on and the various movements of things. And so it's again, it's a very metaphorical kind of map. It's a map of no real place, but you know, surprisingly, I can see the Russian, whoops, I'm sorry, I can see the Russians coming in here, it's coming in here. It almost has a little Middle East look to it. I, know, I, I like maps of the Crusades. And, but seriously, so that's another use of maps. So once again, Another thing to add about maps and one of that thing is maps and imagination, maps and allegories, maps and metaphors. And that's what this does. Now, how many people have seen this map? It's a map of the church missions. Uh, uh, yeah, this is really interesting too, because it shows uh, the progress of progress report. It's a cartographic progress report of Mormonism's uh, key value of spreading the faith, right? Through the answer the world's good gospel. So uh, it's an extremely complicated uh, uh, map that is uh, that originates now, this is just last year, map, or the history of map, it originates in the church of the office of mapping, or the mapping division. So that um, one of the aspects of Mormonism that you should recognize is that Mormons are always using technology in that way, uh, as they do in almost everything else, because whenever they do something about themselves, it's to spread the word and to spread information about the faith. And so uh, using the highest technology, uh, digital resolutions and all sorts of things, they uh, arrive at this map. It shows an awful lot of areas that are still uh, uh, open or non, not available for missionizing, you can see a lot of that gray area there and things like that. But you can see the dominance of saints in various areas and so on. And incidentally, South America, Chile has been said to be the, uh, uh, Chile is spring being shaped here like this. That's been said to be the most successful Latin American success story. And, and another success story in, in Mormon uh, proselytizing and missionizing is, of course, the Pacific, the Pacific Islands. That's a place where, uh, in, in the world outside of, uh, uh, Utah and some other places where the Mormons can be in the majority in a number of places. I'm going to bring it to you guys, which are normally a minority in the region. You know, <laughs> parts of the world. You can go back to you. Even the trials and tribulations of Mormon missionaries in the field. Uh, how do Mormon missionaries get to where they're going? How do they navigate and how do they move around and how do they interact? What kinds of maps are needed? I was just at dinner with a couple of LDS folks who had on missions and they just told me all about the different maps they used and constructed on missions. I said, this would make a great book. I talk about it in just a few pages in a chapter, but this is a subject that really needs work and that is how And how they need today to be very rich anecdotally um, based on the journals, diaries, and interviews. So I'd love to see somebody do a map on, uh, excuse me, a book on mapping uh, missionary activity. Because the success or failure of a mission in part depends on uh, the cartographic uh, skills. In this case, 
the uh, North Argentine mission split off from the South, and you can look at the texts and all the uh, <coughs> uh, all the, uh, the trials that the, that the Mormons went through in doing this, and you can then see how they visualize, how they make a graphic, <coughs> and this is embedded in the archives as just one of the documents that happens to survive along with the mission uh, records. Now we're getting close to the end of my talk here, and so I want to show you a map that no longer exists. It is a map that uh, I happened to notice when I was doing my field work back in 1969. You can see this. Uh, you can see this heavy Mopar souped up car, which has probably been a junkyard for 35 years now. But this is 1969. But look at the side of this building, Smith's Vapor. And in this little instrument, uh, this is the same place where Phelps uh, was when he uh, drew that map, the diagram of the Utah Valley and so on. Only this one is, of course, this is oriented south because if you're driving here on, on the highway, this used to be the main highway through uh, town before the interstate was built. So this is U5 before the interstate people. This building's gone, that's gone, yeah. the Mopar car's gone. Okay. The mountains are still there. Okay. <laughs> but otherwise, just about everything to change. Now, this book shows what Mormons hoped to create in 1849, and this is sort of the culmination of it. And now it's not only saying, hey, look, here is you know the uh, the one of the cities of Zion and a very special place with a name like that. It's got the red to the uh, orthogonal grid, and, it, and it's basically oriented south, so if you're a motorist, you can make choices as to what to see. And so here's, uh, you know, Mount Nebo, Deer, you know, the sand dunes, you know, and the place. But this is really private place. We don't know who made this map because everything is gone, and, and I can't even find anybody who remembers this map. I've got to do a little bit more research, but does anybody remember this map? Any old timers in the audience like me? Um, sorry to outlive my audience, this troubles me. <laughs> Let's see. And so that's very interesting. It's vernacular map making at its best in a way. It's non pretentious, it's used for advertising, but it's also used to promote the feeling that this is a great place, and it's a place that's not only the settlement, but also the wilderness. And it's a place that you can share experience. A couple of more in the Church uh, History Museum up in Salt Lake City. Uh, I saw this work of art. So it's a ceramic kind of sculpture. It's probably about four feet tall and about so wide. It's just beautiful ceramic like slide. It looks like something out of you know, 2001 a Space Odyssey or something. But what it is is really it's called Flat of the Valleys. Flat of the Valleys. Uh, and it's by Peter Walker, an environmental artist. And I had a great conversation with Peter all about what inspired him to do this. And he said, this is a, a depiction of the saints and their impact spread across a, 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 an ancient lake like, you know, Lake Bonneville and so on. But it symbolizes the kind of environment and it symbolizes the confluence of Mormonism at, at a certain point. And it refers to the challenges that Mormons have to make and will have to make in terms of interfaith efforts and things like that. So here's an artist who recognizes that there's a cartographic way of expressing himself and his faith. And so to all the other single words and a couple of words I added that you can think about in terms of maps, think of this one as a, a map of challenges, a map of faith, a map of trying to deal with the future and understand the past. Once again, we see the rectilinear 